welcome to the Center for Migration Studies webinar and discussion of the new report, Climbing the Ladder, Roadblocks Faced by Immigrants in the New York City Construction Industry. During this webinar, we're going to hear from the authors of the report as well as several construction industry experts. This event will last about an hour and 15 minutes. It will be recorded and we will share the recording with all of the registrants after the event. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to the moderator of today's event, CMS's Executive Director, Donald Kerwin. Thank you, Emma, I appreciate it. And I wanted to thank all of you for being with us today for the release of what's a very important report on immigrant construction workers in New York City titled Climbing the Ladder, Roadblocks Faced by Immigrants in the New York City Construction Industry. The report is the result of a process that began in 2020 in conversations between the Center for Migration Studies and Locker Associates, in particular, Mike Locker. I think we began um, at that point with the recognition of the importance of immigrant construction workers to the growth and to the expansion of the city itself coupled with a sense of how little we knew about their lives, their work, their social networks. And this was particularly the case for the undocumented. We knew too little about how they sought and found work in this sector, their working conditions, the occupational hazards they faced, the support they received from unions, worker centers, and public agencies, the training that was available to them, their strategies for improving their conditions, and how the pandemic and related policies had affected them. Along the way, um, I know this project has benefited from extraordinary support and expertise of countless partners. And although um, nobody likes these, these thank yous, these extended thank yous, I want to, I feel obliged and would really like to thank a number of people at this point. The first is the New York Community Trust, Eve Stotland, who supported this work and kind of guided it from start to finish. The speakers today and their organizations, um, particularly Claudia Enriquez, who's the Director of Litigation in the Office of Labor Policy and Standards at the NYC Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. Yesenia Mata, who's the Executive Director of La Colmena. Jeff Hermanson, who's the Director of Organizing at the Solidarity Center. Our research team, which included at one point Daniela Alulema, who subsequently left CMS. Research partners who helped to guide the project included, of course, Locker Associates, both Mike Locker and Mel Howlett, the La Colmena Worker Center staff, especially Lasenia Mata and Arlette Cepeda, James Parrott, who assisted with research methodology, the people who reviewed the report, La Colmena, Locker, Jeff, Charlene Obernauer of the New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health, our extensive advisory group, and I'm not going to name them all, and then CMS staff who were so key to the production of the report, Melissa Katsouris, Emma Winter, Scott Brown, and from the Scalabrini International Migration Network, Josue Bustillo. And last but not least, our really profound thanks all of the construction workers and experts who shared their stories and to the unions and to the business representatives who helped us connect with the interviewees. We definitely couldn't have pulled off this report without your help and guidance. Um, the speakers today are going to speak for about seven minutes each. And then once they've all finished, we'll take questions. And you can, of course, send in questions in the meantime. And we'll have significant time to kind of answer them and be in dialogue together. Vicki Virgin, who's, um, who's a senior fellow for the Center for Migration Studies, will start by providing a top line overview of some of the findings based on administrative data and interviews as part of the project. And she'll have a particular focus um, on the status of these workers and, and occupations. So Vicki, why don't we start with you and then we'll then we'll turn to the, the other speakers. Great, thank you, Don. Um, so as Don just said, I will be sharing the basically the brow, the broad brushstrokes uh, outline of the immigrant construction workforce. Who are the immigrant construction workers? Where do they come from? 
and why are they important to this industry? This will provide good context for the research that Jacqueline will present following me. So uh, if we could put my first slide up, please. Thank you. Um, so the following slides will present data from the American Community Survey. We use data from the five-year period 2015 to 2019. These estimates can be interpreted as an average over this five-year period. So for example, there were, one, there were 114,000 immigrant construction workers living in New York City on average between the, um, between the years of 2015 and 2019. So you can switch, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, to, so to begin, the construction industry in New York City has grown rapidly in recent years. After having declined during the last recession, this sector has surpassed its pre-recession level. By 2019, construction spending in New York City reached a record high of $65 billion. Um, immigrants are integral to this industry. Starting at the bottom, we see that 37% of the city's population is foreign born. Immigrants comprise an even greater share of the labor force and in the construction industry, 63%. This means that of all the workers in the construction industry in New York City, almost two thirds are immigrants. This is the largest share of foreign born workers in, in any industry sector in the city. Next slide. Where do the foreign born construction workers come from? We compare New York City with the US by region of the world. At first glance, you can see that over half of those in the US are from North America. Oh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong one. So sorry. Um, excuse me. This, I got the wrong slide. Back up. Okay, so this chart shows the documentation status of immigrant construction workers for New York City and the US. In general, we can see that the New York City construction workers were more likely to have some kind of legal status compared to construction workers in the US. This is the blue naturalized citizen and the orange legal non citizens. More than half of the US construction workers in the US were undocumented immigrants compared to 41% in New York City. Okay, next slide. Now we're gonna talk about where they come from. Um, you, as I was saying, you can see at first glance that over half of immigrants construction workers in the US are from North America, which is primarily Mexico. This compares to 15% in New York City. Um, also, at first glance, you can see how much more diverse the city's immigrant construction workforce is. In part, this reflects the city, the diversity of the city itself, with the exception of Asians who are underrepresented in this industry sector. A quick note about how we define these regions. We divide Central and South America region into Hispanic and non-Hispanic countries. We make this distinction to highlight the contribution of the West Indian community to New York City. For example, the non-Hispanic countries of Central and South America include among others, Jamaica, Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, and Guyana. And the Hispanic countries of South and Central America include the Dominican Republic, as well as the countries of South Central America and South America, excluding Guyana. Um, and as I said, the North America primarily includes, is, is primarily Mexico. So back to the New York City bar, the largest share of immigrants in the city come from the Hispanic countries of Central and South America. They represent 39% of the total. The second largest group is from the non-Hispanic countries of Central and South America. And the remaining regions are split pretty much equally. Okay, next slide. Construction workers are a linguistically diverse workforce. Over one half speak Spanish, 21% 21 21 speak English, and then it drops off after that with less than 6% each speaking Chinese, Hindi and related languages, Polish and Russian. Next slide. This is a chart of all foreign born workers in the city. The pie on the right is the distribution of where all the immigrant workers live by borough. And on the left 
are where the foreign born construction workers live. Um, you can see construction workers are more likely to live in the borough of Queens. In addition, their share is larger than the share of all immigrant workers who make this borough their home, 35%. On the other hand, relatively fewer construction workers live in Manhattan compared to all immigrant workers. So 15% of all foreign born workers live in Manhattan and only 6% of the foreign born construction workers live in Manhattan. Construction workers are concentrated in the Queens neighborhoods of Jackson Heights and North Corona, Ridgewood, Glendale and Middle Village, and Elmhurst and South Corona. There is also a sizable number of workers living in the Brooklyn neighborhoods of Bensonhurst and Bath Ridge. Next slide. Uh, age. Um, we again are going to compare New York City with the US uh, foreign born construction workers. In general, the city's construction workers are slightly older than they are in the US. Uh, I think the, the age category that jumps out at me is the 55 to 64 years. 16% of the city's immigrant workforce is, uh, are of these ages compared to 10% um, in the US. Overall, the median age of construction workers in New York City is 42, two years older than that in the US. Next slide. This slide shows annual median earnings for all construction workers in New York City by immigration and citizenship status. US citizen construction workers, both the US born, native born, and naturalized had the highest median earnings of all groups, 46,000 and 43,000. Their earnings were much greater than those of the legal non-citizens and undocumented. Median earnings for both of these groups were just over 30,000. This is an interesting finding because you would expect that legal non-citizens would have higher wages than undocumented immigrants. This is something to be explored. Uh, the next slide, I'm going to shift gears here um, and talk about an issue that's, that's very important in the construction industry, and that's the misclassification of workers. This happens when workers get misclassified as independent contractors when they should be employees. This is a big problem for a number of reasons. One, employers who engage in this practice get an unfair advantage over other employers. And they do this by evading such costs as payroll taxes and workman's comp. And they are also off the hook for providing health insurance and paying minimum, their workers the minimum wage. Studies also indicate that misclassification leads to substantial losses in tax revenue. In 2010, New York State passed a law that created a new standard for determining whether a worker is an employee or independent contractor in the construction industry and penalizes employers who misclassify their employees. Using the American Community Survey and the quarterly census of employment and wages, we estimate the number of misclassified workers in New York City from 2011 to 2019 to see if we can find any changes that could be due to this law. So following on the two bottom rows of this table, we find that both the number and share of misclassified workers have declined over the last decade. In 2019, there were 47,000 misclassified construction workers, down from 71,000 in 2011. This represented a 34% decline. The share of misclassified workers also decreased from 46 to 31 during the same period. The decrease in, mass, in misclassified construction workers is a promising development, yet the problem remains acute. This topic will be taken up later by our guests on this panel. And with that, I'll turn it over to Don to introduce Jacqueline. Thanks very much, Vicki. And um, yes, next to Jacqueline Pavillon, who's the deputy director and one of the two co-authors along with Vicki on this report, um, Jack, Jacqueline, will you speak a little bit to the barriers to immigrant integration that the report found and um, 
into immigrant well-being based on the interviews and some of the other supplemental data sets that you relied upon in producing the report? Sure, thanks, Don. Um, so for this project, we interviewed uh, 20 construction workers, immigrant construction workers from all across New York City and all different backgrounds. We also interviewed 10 experts in the field, including in business representatives, employers, representatives of community-based organizations, city workers, and union organizers. And as you, many of you probably know in the construction industry, if you're familiar with it, uh, word of mouth is very crucial to, to finding employment. And it was also very crucial to helping us find our interviewees. So in addition to everyone who, who Don thanked him, I would like to thank our speakers again, and also many of the interviewees themselves who helped push push our project down the ladder and uh, you know connect us with our interviewees. So, um, so if you wouldn't mind putting up the slides, Melissa. So throughout the course of this this study, we used probably about a dozen different data sets in addition to the commu American Community Survey data that Vicky presented, in addition to these interviews and. We found that you know, unions are very crucial to immigrants in the construction industry, uh, and it can help ameliorate many of the barriers that they are facing due to immigration status, due to language barriers, discrimination, uh, even cross-cutting gender gaps, and um, also issues with recognizing people's credentials and uh, letting them access training based on their immigration status or perhaps due to lack of knowledge. So I just want to take a look at why, why it, unions are so crucial to the construction industry. So if you look at this, uh, this graph that's here, it shows the union non-union wage gap or by industry, how much more people working in union jobs are earning than those working in non-union jobs in similar similar fields. So you can see all the way to the left in the construction industry, this union wage advantage is across the United States is 46%. That is the highest of, of any industry. And as Vicki mentioned, uh, foreign born workers in New York City uh, comprise the largest share of any industry compared to any industry. And a large part of that is due to wage theft and wage exploitation, why this gap is so big. And it really points to the fact that unions can help protect workers from not only wage exploitation, but also in regards to their safety and their, their workplace. So if you could move to the next slide, please, Melissa. So this shows the, the union non-union wage gap by nationality. So just to break this down, this is data from the current population survey in 2021. Uh, and if you look in, and this is for New York State, not the United States. So the, the column all the way to the right is what we're calling the union advantage or in industries, how much more union workers are earning compared to non-union workers. So this top bracket is looking at all other industries compared to the the construction industry and the bottom bracket is looking at just the construction industry. So you can see that in the bottom bracket here, looking at the second column for foreign born workers, foreign born unionized workers in New York state are earning 64% more than their non-union counterparts. And to make a comparison to native born workers, they're only earning about 16% more. So we can see that a lot, what we found in this report is much of that is due to the wage theft and exploitation that is that many immigrant workers are experiencing. And you can see this 64% really jumps out um, because compared to other industries in the top bracket, for example, foreign born workers are earning 45% more if they're unionized um, and native born workers, you know, this, this is a little bit more similar. The native born union advantage is about 38%. So it's these union contracts are extremely beneficial, not only uh, to everyone in the construction industry, but specifically to foreign born workers. Uh, so if we could move, move to the next slide, please. We found that uh, per those union findings that people are very much so exploited based on immigration status, especially the undocumented 
many of whom cannot access certain unions that receive federal funding for apprenticeship programs. So I just, I just wanted to pull out a quote that is in the report, and you'll find that the report itself has mixed method studies, so both data and quotes like this. So um, this is just illustrating wage theft that occurs on a daily basis. Uh, one worker said it was very common for us to sometimes get off work two hours past our working hours. They don't pay us for those two hours. That is basically working all day long. Nobody wants that. In those two hours, I could have already arrived home. I could already be changing, eating. I could have already cleaned myself up, done the laundry. The basic working day pays $120. That's what you're going to earn, $120. Regardless if you work from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., it's $120. I don't know if the boss does that intentionally. I don't know if all of us who work for him, I do know that all of us who work for him are immigrants. I think that's why there is also no one in quotes legal with him. In this case, the boss is the only legal person. However, if you are working based on that word of mouth, like the employers will say, I'm giving you this opportunity. That is the justification employers use for doing things like that. So based on uh, these interviews, we found that immigrants are much more likely to be exploited based on immigration status in regards to wage theft, but also because they often lack a social safety net here in the city and they are, if they are undocumented, excluded from public services and welfare. So they really have that need to work and often will take exploitative working arrangements. Uh, other interviewees, which you'll find in the report, describe scenarios of structural racism with people of color being given more physically intensive jobs. Um, there was female workers described a lot of sexism in the industry, though it was described to have been improving over time with more awareness. And also those with limited English proficiency and those who were unable to get their credentials recognized were also left behind. Next slide, please. So this graph is just showing a correlation. Uh, and you can think of each of these dots as a single occupation in in the construction industry. One might be plumbers, one might be pipe fitters, one might be laborers. And as you go to the right along the, the bottom axis, that would be the number of fatalities per million. So as you go to the right, you're thinking more fatalities in that industry. And as you go up along the, the Y axis, the vertical axis, is the share of workers in that profession who are foreign born. And this upward sloping line indicates that the more workers in that industry who are foreign born, the more worker fatalities you're seeing in the sense that workers are often, because of their immigration status, facing more fatal uh, working conditions. And we did the same graph for those with link limited English proficiency and the share who are not only foreign born, but are undocumented. And this line is even steeper, meaning those with limited English proficiency and those who are undocumented are much more likely to be working in conditions that are fatal. Next slide, please. There's been a lot of growth in construction technology over the last decade. Uh, you can think of this as a relative growth. Uh, so fixing the, fixing the venture capital investment at year 2020 in the blue line representing all other industries compared to the construction industry, how much venture capital has grown over the past decade. And you can just see compared to all other industries, venture capital investments in the construction technology has just skyrocketed over the last decade. And this is, we point to this in this report because in some ways it has polarized and, you know, kind of made a different skill set needed with those very high skilled to be able to operate technology needed, but also very low skilled at kind of leaving behind some middle, middle range workers uh, due to this growth in technology. However, this growth in technology has also uh, made certain jobs less physically intensive, which has opened up the industry to some women who would other not, otherwise uh, not have entered the industry. And so kind of the impact on the industry itself has been um, quite, quite nuanced, but there is a section of the report that looks at that. Next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to also highlight in this pandemic, we're living through the essentiality of construction workers. They were deemed essential workers and on most projects and comprised a huge portion of the essential workforce in New York City, uh, as other CMS reports indicate. Um, but during this time, many construction workers often had to step out of their roles, um, as, as pointed to by this quote here of a worker who was working in a uh, hospital at the time. Uh, 
she described that we construction workers were divided into three groups. One group was transporting the bodies, one was bringing the PPE to the floors where COVID patients were, and the third group was moving stuff from regular doctor's offices into storages so those offices could be converted into COVID patient room. I was in the elevator transporting the bodies, transporting the movers, and transporting the people with the PPE, PPE, taking it everywhere. Every time a body came to the elevator, when that body left, I used to change my own gown and PPE, and I had to clean the elevator. Sometimes that would happen 60 to 70 times a day. Many immigrants in our study contracted COVID. This particular worker uh, lost her sense of smell and taste permanently. And it really highlights the essentiality that construction workers, especially immigrant construction workers, were playing during this pandemic. Next slide, please. So to uh, address some of these barriers that are faced, uh, that immigrants are facing due to their status, lack of work authorization, racism, uh, other barriers such as limited English proficiency, uh, there's a series of policy recommendations and I'm just going to highlight a few. The first is um, there's the New York State Senate um, should preserve the New York scaffold law um, the top five most reported OSHA violations on construction sites from 2017 to 2021 all involved scaffolding problems and the risk of falls, and falls con constituted the top cause of fatalities during this period. To protect workers in the case of uh, an accident, it's imperative to uphold this law, which is being challenged by certain special interest groups. The New York State Senate should also pass Carlos's law. This is a bill that has been uh, pending since, uh, that's been stalled since 2017. Uh, it is named Carlos's law after an undocumented Ecuadorian immigrant who was buried alive on a job site where managers had repeatedly ignored safety warnings from inspectors and the contractor and construction company were only fined $10,000 for his death uh, despite their negligence, which is the maximum OSHA fine contractors currently faced. This Carlos's law would, um, would make that fine from half a million to a million dollars for those who are negligent and whose safety violations result in fatalities. And, and although uh, this, this contractor was criminally uh, convicted of negligent hom homicide, um, this law would also make uh, you know, worker endangerment endangerment, first degree, secondary, and third degree felonies. Um, the New York State Senate and the Real Estate Board of New York should ensure prevailing wages for construction workers are included in the 421A Affordable New York Housing Tax Incentive Program. Uh, this is a program established in 1971, uh, which gives a tax exemption to for the construction of new housing in New York. Um, in more recent years, the program has been used to promote affordable housing, and it's set to expire in June 2022. The program requires the prevailing wage for building service employees and a minimum average wage for construction workers in certain buildings. Um, but uh, construction workers um, are the, the replacement plan by the governor. Uh, we, we hope that it maintains the prevailing wage standards. Uh, for building service employees, uh, and which is currently exempting construction workers. So we, we do hope that that uh, in this reconsideration that is taken, taken into account uh, that construction workers should have this prevailing wage. We also think uh, there are many pending bills that CMS these other reports of studies that create a pathway to legal permanent residence and uh, citizenship for undocumented construction workers, uh, including passing a rolling registry program to uh, provide legal status to the undocumented. This is something the US uh, Congress should consider. And we also provide a series of recommendations to unions. Um, there are more than this listed in the reports for both policymakers and unions, but one is that unions should offer more English language courses, as this was pointed as very crucial to the safety on a team site um, and partner with CBOs, community based organizations to do so when possible when they do not have their own capacity to offer such courses in the, uh, to the extent that is necessary. So uh, I thank you. I'll pass it on to our guest speakers now. Uh, back to Don and uh, to our guest speakers now. Thanks, Jacqueline. That was a great summary. And Jeff, um, you know, one of the most impressive sets of findings in the report, and Jacqueline set forth some of the numbers here, is the difference that union membership makes for immigrant construction workers. I mean, you might call it a union wage and safety premium for, for foreign born unionized workers. It's really quite startling and impressive. So I wonder if you could speak on that issue and whatever else you'd like to comment on. Thanks, Don, <clears throat> and good afternoon, everybody. 
Yeah, I, I worked as a union organizer for the Carpenters District Council in New York City. Um, and it was very, very clear to me that if you go to a non-union job site, you see immigrant workers uh, really dominating the workforce. You go to a union job site, you don't see the same, although there's significant numbers of immigrant workers on unionized jobs. It's not the same proportion as in the non-union work sites. And on the non-union work sites, you know, you, you see fear when you try to talk to a non-union immigrant worker, fear of being fired, fear of... Uh, fear even of the union uh, as, uh, you know, maybe looking to throw them off the job and replace them with union workers. Uh, so it's very difficult. So in spite of the fact that the union wage gap is 64% in construction, it's very difficult for immigrant workers to become part of the union. And, uh, you know, there's the issue of uh, work authorization of the two thirds of, of construction workers in New York City that are immigrant workers, 41% of them are undocumented. That means about 25% of construction workers in New York City are undocumented workers. They don't have work authorization. For them to get a, a union job is almost impossible. And, you know, we, we uh, when we tried to organize the workers and we encountered undocumented workers, uh, they were very frightened of um, being, of losing their job. So in spite of the fact that the union wage difference is 64%, it's very hard to organize uh, uh, immigrant workers into the union. And the unions themselves place some obstacles and, and you know, in use, recent years, I think unions have recognized that they need to organize immigrant workers and they need to organize, find ways to organize undocumented immigrant workers. And they're changing their practices, but they're really prevented from uh, really opening up uh, the union's apprenticeship programs because they're federally funded and the federal funds uh, prevent unions from opening the apprenticeship programs to workers without uh, work authorization. <clears throat> so all of the advantage of, of union membership, the advantage in wages, the advantage in safety. If you look at the, uh, the figures of uh, safety, uh, the OSHA data show that uh, union workers suffer far less uh, fatalities in, in New York City, 100% of the fatalities last year were non-union workers. Uh, and that, that is a huge difference. Uh, the OSHA data shows that the most serious violations occur on non-union work sites. They show that more violations occur on non-union work sites. And so, you know, that, that is a huge uh, impact on uh, immigrant construction workers. The same in hiring. You know, unions send workers to job sites. Undocumented or immigrant workers don't have that uh, possibility, except for the few that are members of unions. And so they rely on word of mouth, or in some cases, employment agencies that take a portion of their, of their check, or they get their jobs standing on corners, las esquinas. And this is, uh, you know, a very, very big factor in uh, keeping immigrant workers from earning uh, what, they, what they should be earning. Misclassification, union members are not likely to be misclassified. You know, their, their union enforces a proper classification. Unions provide training from the apprenticeship program to specialized training to certification on safety, use of certain equipment. All of that is the union advantage, which is not 
available to most immigrant workers, unfortunately. And the same with benefits, health insurance, pension. I mean, it's one of the interviewees said, it's two different worlds. And it's true that non-union workers don't have, in most cases, the health insurance, the pension, the annuity that, that uh, union members have. And during the pandemic, it became very, very clear the huge gap between union members who had access to, um, to their annuities or their vacation pay that non-union workers did not have. So, you know, 10% uh, of New York City construction workers approximately are immigrant workers. And, uh, you know, that's a very, it, when you think that two thirds of construction workers are immigrants in New York City, but only 10% of union members are immigrant workers. It's a huge, huge difference. And so uh, to me, it's essential that we find a way to deal with the question of undocumented workers, that we find a path to legal work authorization for those workers. 41% of immigrants in the construction industry are undocumented. 25% of construction workers are undocumented. We've got to find a way because they, they, this is the reason of that huge gap. The reason is that employers can exploit undocumented workers and foreign born workers in a way that they cannot exploit unionized workers. So if we don't figure out how to get work authorization for these workers, who are 25% of the construction workers in, the United States, in New York City, an industry that contributes billions of dollars to the city economy, $85 billion in 2021, eight and a half percent of New York City's economy and 25% of them are undocumented workers in the position of being exploited and, and discriminated against. Uh, we've got to do something about that. So um, I just want to point out, I, I now am working in Mexico as a representative of the Solidarity Center of the American Labor Movement in Mexico. And I just I saw an article that pointed out that remittances from the United States by Mexican workers constitute one of the largest sources of foreign exchange in the Mexican economy, almost as much as tourism and more than petroleum exports, right? And of the $50 billion in remittances from Mexican workers in the United States to their families in Mexico, 20% of that total, $10 billion, came from Mexican construction workers in the United States. The largest single group of remittances came from Mexican construction workers in the United States. That means that $6,000 a year, $500 a month per worker is sent home to their families in Mexico. Just imagine that, right? And, and these workers are earning what? $30,000 on average, that's in New York City, it's probably less than that nationally. But out of that $30,000, each one of them is sending $6,000 to their families in Mexico. Without those remittances, Mexican families in Mexico would not have survived nearly as well as they have over the last couple of years in this pandemic. It really has been a sustenance. So what we're talking about are a group of workers who contribute to New York City's economy, who contribute to their families back in, in Mexico and other places. It's the same for Central American and South American workers, I'm quite sure, and probably Asian workers as well. They're making a tremendous sacrifice. They're contributing to our economy and they deserve to be treated with the greatest respect and to have the access to the benefits that union workers uh, enjoy. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. That's very powerful. Um, Yesenia, um, I think all everybody's so impressed kind of with the work of La Colmena with um, 
undocumented workers. And perhaps you, you could segue from Jeff, Jeff's presentation to speak to some of the unique barriers that day laborers face in this industry and how community-based institutions like La Colmena meet their needs and fill their protection and their service gaps. And, and of course, we're talking in this case, particularly about non-unionized undocumented workers. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yesenia Mata. I am the executive director of La Colmena. And well, I'm going to start off by introducing La Colmena. La Colmena is a community-based organization working with day laborers, domestic workers, and other low-wage immigrant workers in Staten Island um, through organizing, education, culture, and equitable economic development. And well, La Culmena also forms part of the day labor coalition in New York City, which consists of five organizations, each representing its own borough, like La Culmena representing Staten Island. Um, and as my colleagues just mentioned, the realities of what the immigrant worker goes through, uh, which shows the many barriers that um, immigrant workers and day laborers have, such as immigration status, um, discrimination, and poor work arrangements, which this hinders workers from escaping the cycle of economic exploitation. And this is why at La Colmena, we support the immigrant worker as soon as they step into the door. Uh, first, we make sure that the worker has all of the necessary documentation, such as an IDNYC passport, and then we move on to enroll them in OSHA and SST classes so they can obtain uh, their card to work at a construction site. And you see, technology and English are one of the many barriers um, that immigrant workers and day laborers have, uh, which my colleagues already elaborated on it. Um, La Colmena helps um, with the process of setting up uh, the appointments to enroll the immigrant worker, the day laborer, um, such as in into getting the IDNYC appointment, um, an appointment with the Consulado de Mexico, um, for them to be able to um, obtain their SST and OSHA card, go to the classes. Um, and the way th that uh, the day laborers become aware of La Colmena is by word of mouth. Um, some become surprised that there's support. Uh, however, there's hesitation by some, which this is why day labor centers do their best to gain the trust of the workers by showing success stories and letting them know that we're here to support them. Uh, such as La Colmena every morning provides breakfast and dispatches workers. We ensure that they know about their rights and are up to date of uh, are up to date uh, with any new laws. And additionally, we are ensuring that we can provide them with English classes. However, um, as it was mentioned, um, it, the, one of the, pri the primary step that, that we do is to create trust. And that is meeting the worker where they are at, such as um, setting up uh, meetings around 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. or meeting them like during breakfast or going to Las Paradas and also following up with them um, because many of them are just trying to support their family. So they cannot be taking off work or moving their schedule around. And you see when the immigrant worker is constantly being mistreated, it is hard for them to trust. So this is why we build trust, organize and provide them with the necessary resources. And now it's thinking ahead. What happens when the immigrant worker gets older? Um, there is no pension, there is no 401k versus a union worker who is able to obtain this. So there is much work yet to be done in order to support uh, workers as a whole, regardless of the immigration status. And this is why I thank CMS for bringing this report to light and showing the, the work um, that the day labor centers uh, do uh, to support holistically the immigrant worker. Thank you very much. And Claudia, let's, um, let's turn to you now. And um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, you know, one of the themes of the report is several people have mentioned involve the worker misclassifications and you know, all the problems that that practice causes for the workers, but also the, um, for those employers who play by the rules, you know, which is a theme that Vicky mentioned. And um, 
and of course, the related issue of kind of the wage and hour problems faced by immigrant construction workers, particularly non-unionized, undocumented workers. So if you could speak to those issues, we'd, we'd very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for having us. Um, so my name is Claudia Enriquez. I work for the New York City Department of Consumer Protection in a division called the Office of Labor Policy and Standards. And we are, the best way to think of us is almost like a mini Department of Labor for the, for the city of New York. We enforce those laws that apply to workers in New York City. Um, we enforce a, a, a quite a few different laws. The main one uh, that, that I think overlaps with construction workers is paid sick leave, paid safe and sick leave. Um, but typically where a worker has a paid safe or sick leave claim, uh, and paid sick leave just means the, the New York City law that requires employers to provide a certain amount of sick leave to workers, and that's regardless of immigration status. Um, Typically where a worker has a sick leave complaint, there's also a wage and hour complaint. So we don't, um, our office does not handle wage and hour complaints, that's through the State Department of Labor. Um, but we do provide referrals to nonprofits and to, um, to, to the Department of Labor, or you know, in some cases, private attorneys. And in my personal capacity before coming to work at this office, I did almost exclusively wage an hour um, at the New York State Att Attorney General's office, as well as um, various legal aid organizations in other states. So I'm quite familiar with um, some of these issues that the workers face. And um, I think the other speakers have, have um, delved into some of this already, but just to highlight some of the issues that we see as far as wage and hour, particularly in the day labor industry. Um, I think we had a really good quote where the worker um, indicated that they were only paid a daily rate, $120 a day. And what happens in these day labor contexts is that the workers get picked up for this rate um, and it doesn't matter how many hours they worked that's the rate that they get paid. And sometimes they get um, hired for longer projects um, where they, in their work week, may be working more than 40 hours, which would entitle them to overtime um, and that doesn't get paid. And, and where it gets really tricky is with these daily rates is that the workers, you know, in part, it's all tied together, right? They're immigrants, they may not speak English, they don't know their rights. And so you say, well, you, you know, let's say you worked 50 hours this week um, you, those 10 of those hours should be paid at time and a half. Oh, no, I'm not entitled to that because I'm working at this week or at this daily rate or weekly rate or, or that sort of thing. So, um, it, so that, that's definitely a challenge, um, you know, as far as reaching out to workers, kind of getting them to know that they have rights regardless of immigration status in New York State. Um, and actually the right to be paid the minimum wage and overtime, is a, it, it, that's applicable in, in every state. Um, that, you know, how, how overtime is calculated even if you're getting paid at a daily rate and that, um, you know, there are services available for workers who wanna recover that money. And, and, um, and I think we've, we've um, gotten to hear of some of the bar barriers of why workers may not wanna come forward, but once they do, you know, it's, it's on us to educate them. Um, on the issue of independent contractors um, and, and just contracting in general, and, uh, when workers are misclassified, what that means is that the employer, instead of considering the worker an employee, uh, is calling them an independent contractor. And when workers are employees, they have more rights under the law. They have this um, right to minimum wage and overtime, they have right to workers comp um, and, and other um, of those kinds of benefits. And what employers often do, and it's particularly common in the construction industry, is that they will say that the worker is an independent contractor and then they can just pay whatever they want because it's a contract you're paying for the job and it doesn't matter how many hours it takes um it was mentioned that new york state passed a law uh, addressing this issue um it's still a problem however and um you know we do have the tools to um to be able to litigate this in court both um through the state law and and um and generally the the um the 
looking at the facts and establishing just because the employer calls the relationship an independent contractor doesn't mean that that's the case. It would have to be, um, there's a few factors that are considered um, who, how much control is exercised by the employer. If they exercise more control over the work, that leads more likely to be um, an employee if it's just part of the same work that the employer is doing. Um, or if you have a separate business, then that would be um, more in line with being an independent contractor. So as an example, um, you hire, you're um, putting up walls, but you hire someone to come in and do the plumbing. That's probably an independent contractor. If it's a team of 10 guys and you are the one putting, it, putting up the walls, then that's more likely to be uh, an employee. And so it's very fact specific, um, but, but the tools are there to, to help us um, you know, enforce those rights. And then the other challenge is, um, and particularly this is common in industries that employ a lot of undocumented workers where because the workers don't have legal status, there'll be a subcontractor that does. And, um, and then the subcontractor contracts with the general contractor to pr provide particular service. The subcontract typically is not, um, it's just another person really, like they might be just like a step up financially from the workers. They might have a truck or something, but they're not um, particularly well resourced. And so if anything happens and the subcontractor doesn't get paid or doesn't get paid enough, then that trickles down to the workers um, who don't get paid. And so, um, and, and there's a law that recently went into effect that um, makes the general contractor responsible for those wages it's pretty new so we'll see um hopefully that will have a positive effect on this going forward um traditionally we've um established that the general contractor is responsible based on sort of looking at these same like control factors and all that but hopefully with this new law um it'll it'll streamline that process because it makes them actually automatically liable so with that i'll wrap up so we can have time for questions thank you Thank you very much. And in fact, we do have uh, we do have a number of questions. And um, so the panelists don't have to each of them don't have to answer every question or, or we won't get through them. Are there any wage gaps between men and women construction workers? And could you discuss more of the challenges facing immigrant women construction workers? Are their numbers growing and by how much? It was mentioned that the sexist treatment was lessening due to increased awareness. What efforts have been made to educate workers on this issue? Thank you for the important work. So gaps between men and women construction workers. I think I can start and then I'd like to turn to some of our, our panelists who are you know, working with unions and community-based organizations. Um, so as upon speaking with female construction workers, um, there are, what I was told from our interviewees um, is that in the union world, you know, there's no pay discrimination based on gender in the sense that it depends on where you are in your apprenticeship or foreman position, whatever you are in, uh, there, there aren't necessarily pay gaps. However, many female workers, both those who are non-unionized and those who were unionized, but formerly non-unionized, uh, described um, that there was a quite a bit of pay discrimination. Uh, also, I don't have the exact numbers in this report, um, but many workers, you know, described uh, who had been in the industry for a long time, described scenarios in which maybe they were actually in a leadership position, but because, you know, the the contractor on the job didn't want to um, say, wanted to save face and not make the the male employees who were in positions below her feel, you know, <laughs> like their masculinity was at risk. They um, they would pay her the same amount as the people she was managing. So that was one example of you know somebody who was in the leadership position but was receiving the same pay as the people she was managing. Um, a lot of people described situations of sexual harassment, uh, professional harassment in the sense that, you know, why you shouldn't be in this industry. Um, but um, to 
have some light at the end of the tunnel. Many of the female workers and union organizers who had been in the industry for a long time described that it, it has been getting slightly uh, better over time just because more women have been entering the industry. Um, New York City, uh, as of 2019, had more than 6% of the construction workers um, as female construction workers, uh, which was more than the nation at large, which was just 3%. Um, and the number of apprenticeship slots reserved for women across construction unions was 15%. Um, there's a program uh, called Non-Traditional Employment for Women. It's a pre-apprenticeship program that's supposed to help train women to go into construction apprenticeships after they complete this program. Uh, many women describe that as especially useful. Um, but at the same time, you know, many women describe positions as maybe there is not a bathroom, a female bathroom on site, uh, especially on non-union, uh, on non-union job sites. Um, and so I, I think, you know, sexism still does exist in the industry, obviously, on both union and non-union sites. Um, I think it is the, the pay discrimination, it's harder to actually implement that on a union site. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it's much less if so than it would be on non-union sites where the pay scale is to be you know, determined at will. Um, uh, but again, I will point to technology has made, um, has made it easier for certain women to enter the industry. Uh, that was something that many people pointed out with male and female workers. So I'll, I'd, I'd turn it over to also to some of maybe the community-based organizations or, or union reps too. Maybe maybe to speak on the, the public education or the education of workers on sexism, any initiatives along those lines that you'd like to lift up? So I can, um, thank you, Jacqueline, uh, for providing that information. I can talk a bit uh, more on what the day labor centers are doing to include women in the construction um, industry. So for so long, the construction industry, um, it was primarily held by, by males. Um, so um, as this new era is coming, um, we are seeing many uh, women interested in joining this type of field. So this is why La Colmena, including the other day labor centers, they are now, um, cre they created classes, a pre-apprenticeship program just specifically for women. For example, at La Colmena, we understand that um, if you're undocumented, you cannot join unions, however, uh, and, be, and, and be part of the pre-apprenticeship program. So what we did was created our own. So we did this in partnership with Makerspace. And what we're doing is creating that space for women. And it's a woman-led class. And they feel very comfortable. They feel very much um, that this is something new for them. Um, however, before... Um, uh, we dispatch anyone to go out to work, we let them know about their rights. So we let them know how much they should be getting paid, how when it should be their lunch break, um, at what time they should be getting out. So it's it's a way to let women know about their rights, but also letting them know that they could also be part of this new construction industry um, uh, site. However, it is, um, but before them coming into La Colmena, they would discuss um, what Jacqueline mentioned, some of them would say that they were either, um, a, you know, that they were sexually abused or that they were discriminated or that they were undermined. So this is why part of the work that La Colmena does is to empower the immigrant worker and let them know that they are valued, that their work, that their work matters, because when they come into La Colmena, they come into with that mindset, oh, I, it's it's maybe okay to be discriminated because I'm undocumented or, you know, maybe I should be getting paid this. So it does also, we have to go first through the training process. And then once you empower them, then the women are like, Hey, I want to be able to learn construction. I want to um, carpentry or welding. It's, it's, um, however, it's a training process first. So we need to empower them first in order for them to see themselves in that specific um, job industry. Let me um, let me combine two questions here. Um, were you able to determine when you, whether any of the undocumented workers were actually eligible for some type of status, TPS, DACA, or other 
I mean, is that is legal screening a part of the, um, the work of some of the centers or the unions? And then kind of a second follow-up question or related question, do you have any information on how many immigrants in New York are able to join a union but haven't versus how many are restricted from joining at all because they're undocumented? Sure, I can start there as well. Um, we don't, in this report, have specific numbers on the number of workers who would be eligible for, um, you know, for uh, pending legislation or special legal status programs. However, in a former um, CMS report, we found that 37% uh, of all essen uh, essential, that um, approximately 37% of all essential workers in construction in New York State were immigrants. Um, and there are pending legislation, you know, to provide pathways to legal status and citizenship for um, essential workers, for example. Um, in a former report, um, uh, CMS uh, estimated the number and location of people who would be eligible for pending bills and special legal status. And while we did not estimate them for specifically construction workers, we do have a data tool available on our website where you could request such information, specifically for example, construction workers who are eligible for TPS or DACA, it's, uh, et cetera. Um, and regarding those who have, are eligible to join unions versus those who are excluded from them, I would um, say that not all unions exclude undocumented workers. Um, many of those who, um, those who accept federal funding for their apprenticeship programs cannot often cannot accept undocumented workers. However, even those who said they could accept and do accept undocumented workers, um, they said that you know it's often difficult to place them into employment because often employers will require an I-9 form and then it's hard to place them. Um, the share of workers who are unionized in, across all citizenship and immigration statuses has been decreasing over time. Um, and, you know, while unions have been diversifying racially over time uh, due to kind of trying to cut back some of the, um, some of the nepotism that used to occur in unions where you could, you know, refer someone. Now there's certain numbers of, of spaces that are trying, targets that are aimed to be reached for people of color, for example. Uh, the, the share of unionized workers who are foreign born, both naturalized citizens and legal not citizens has remained stable over time. So while unions have been racially uh, you know, diversifying, they have not been diversifying as much in regards to immigration status. And that, that information is in the report. And I think Jeff has his hand up. No, thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> I, I don't know the figures, but I do know, you know anecdotal, anecdotally is that there are many undocumented workers in the construction trades who really are eligible to regularize their status, but don't know that they're eligible or don't have access to the legal advice that they would need in order to move to regularize their status. And one of the things that <clears throat> community-based organizations, worker centers, do provide often is uh, immigration counseling. It's a wonderful thing. I think in this, as in many areas, unions really should ally with these community-based organizations and provide support for those services that are provided by worker centers, English language training, uh, GED, other, other kind, you know, the safety courses, uh, but most importantly, immigration counseling services so that those people that are eligible to regularize their status actually can do it. And, you know, we, we know of, of construction workers that have been in the United States for 15, 20 years uh, who actually, if they had applied 15 or 20 years ago, you know, the waiting list, would, they would have reached uh, eligibility status. But because they didn't apply, they didn't know to apply back in you know, 20 years ago, uh, they're still in undocumented status. And it's really a shame. Jeff, Jeff can I maybe follow up with a different question, um, sure. which is, or, and others could answer this as well, but um, can you 
Can you please talk more about the obstacles to unionization that unions themselves are responsible for erecting? <clears throat> well, of course, there's been a history of uh, discrimination by unions and the favoring of, you know, uh, native born or white uh, Americans uh, in recruitment. And, uh, you know, the feeling that immigrants are taking our jobs and uh, all of this, uh, you know, re really racist uh, attitudes that, you know, the members quite often feel, and that impacts the leadership who don't want to alienate their members and who want to get reelected. And therefore, you know, we, we have a history of discrimination against foreign born workers and especially undocumented. And then the, the barriers to um, getting, placing undocumented workers on jobs means that unions feel like if we accept them into membership and we can't find jobs for them, you know, what are we really doing? So all of these factors, uh, you know, I, I, I think though primarily the problem is the legal one that, you know, there needs to be comprehensive immigration reform that provides a path to legal status and to ultimately to citizenship for these workers who are, you know, two thirds uh, are immigrants in the construction industry and 25% are undocumented. And so 25% is a huge number of people and, and really they need to be given some opportunity to, you know, these are, hardworking people who, in most cases, pay taxes and, you know, comply with, with all the requirements that one would ask uh, to be a con contributing member of, of society. And so uh, I really think unions should be ad advocating for com comprehensive immigration reform. They should be uh, really pressing politically uh, to bring some, some path to citizenship for these workers. Thank you. Um, so one comment is there are indeed obstacles to joining unions, but don't immigrant workers join mutual aid societies, churches, and football leagues? Could those organizations be the launching pads for organizing? Yusenia, you must, you must have thoughts on this. Yes. Um, well, thank you for that question, because I think this addresses what I had mentioned before, um, gaining the trust of the workers. Uh, day labor centers um, cater specifically to the immigrant worker, day labor, domestic worker, and we culturally understand what they are going through and how to go about it. Um, when we organize, we, we, we meet the workers specifically where they're at, a las paradas, um, during breakfast in the morning. Um, we are there from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., and then we dispatch them to go to work. Um, uh, many instances, um, some may think that it's really, that it may be easy to work with um, day laborers and domestic workers. However, um, there's much training that needs to be involved. As I said before, you need to empower the immigrant workers through organizing. Um, you need to train them on what, the, what are their rights. Um, there are many obstacles and barriers that they also are going through um, as, you know, one, there's a language barrier. Two, they're, um, they, they are very focused on meeting um, their family needs because they need to uh, pay for rent, need to pay for their families, um, whatnot. So, um, a lot of focus is on that where La Colmena tries its best to meet them where they're at. So um, this is why day laborers centers exist, because we are equipped of, of working with with um, with immigrant workers. However, that doesn't mean that we don't partner up with other organizations. We we surely do. We partner up with, um, for example, um, we partner up with Catholic charities for 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 um, for legal services, we partner up with Take Root Justice for legal services. We partner up with um, 
with with NYC health uh, NYC health uh, health and hospitals for vaccines. That doesn't like what we are is that bridge. So I think going to that question, it's it's more we know how to reach the community. So what we what we do is become that bridge for them to to be referred out for other types of resources. So this is more of a, um, a community effort because it just can't be the day labor centers themselves. So, so that is um, that requires uh, work from everyone. And for example, just with the CMS report, um, we're providing information, but through the CMS report, through the work that, that Jacqueline um, did is now bringing out to light what these centers are going through. So it, it requires partnerships from, from various ends. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, this may be a question for Claudia, which is, could you provide me with some information on how to register for OSHA 30 plus 10? I have a client at New Rochelle who only speaks Spanish, or maybe that's Jeff or Yusenia or I don't know. Yeah, unfortunately, I, our, our office doesn't um, doesn't provide those trainings, but I, I do know, for example, NICE, um, which is a, a nonprofit here in New York City, does provide some of these OSHA trainings, and I see Yesenia shaking or, or uh, nodding, so maybe she has more info. Yes, people can call. Um, there's five, five. Uh, as I said, I form part of the Day Labor Coalition. So the Day Labor Coalition consists of five um, day labor organizations. La Colmena represents Staten Island, uh, Worker Justice Project Brooklyn, um, NICE uh, Queens, Catholic Charities Bronx, and the New Freedom Coalition. They just changed their name, um, but they represent Manhattan. So um, if you reach out to those five organizations, uh, depending on what borough you would like to go to, there's a day labor center in, in each borough. Jeff, I think, I think we missed you. You had your hand up there. Yeah, I just want to say that the, you know, the unions have changed and are changing greatly. Uh, and for example, the National Day Laborers Organizing Network is a member of the AFL-CIO Executive Council. We have representatives from worker centers on the Executive Council of the AFL-CIO. And I think, you know, people sometimes think of the unions as, a, you know, white male bastion in, in the construction trades. And of course, we are living with the heritage, right, of, of actions that were taken 20, 30 years ago, but, <clears throat> but unions are changing. And for example, I mean, I think the major way in which women get into the construction trades is through the apprentice programs of trade unions, the laborers, the carpenters, painters, uh, all of them are accepting and even uh, encouraging women to apply for apprenticeship programs, as well as for immigrant workers uh, to apply and providing uh, language assistance uh, for immigrant workers in the apprenticeship program. So I think, you know, we shouldn't uh, stereotype unions either and look at the positive changes that are being made uh, to provide uh, entry for immigrant and women workers. <clears throat> Thank you. We're almost at 315 here. I don't know if anybody has any final short comments to make or want, wants to respond to any of the questions. There's just one question left. Have we reached out to unions to work with them? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, we, with, in the research process, many of our interviewees were representatives of unions uh, and, and or members of unions. And a, the, a section of our policy recommendations are specifically targeted towards unions. And we have been disseminating this report um, across, across the union world. So yeah, yes. And thank you for that comment. Yeah, and thanks to everyone for attending. And um, you're going to receive, as I'm just looking at Emma's note, kind of follow-up emails. If you, if you have particular questions uh, that you weren't able to ask or you didn't get the answers that you were hoping to get, you're welcome to send the, the questions to us and we'll forward them. Um, and then just a final comment, not a question, just want to thank the panel on behalf of the NYC and vicinity district council of carpenters for their hard work and contributions. And thanks to all of you for the tremendous work that you do day in and out and for your great work on this report too. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you. <laughs>